I'm sorry to say, but uh, there is no coffee at the moment. But uh, we have to be on time with, with the current session to not to miss the next coffee break. So I think that's important. <laughs> and uh, therefore, we will start immediately. My name is Marcis Leja. I'm, I'm representing either the University of Latvia or Riga East University Hospital. And this is my great pleasure to chair this session together with Professor Alin Hegmane, who is a distinguished medical oncologist and actually the chief uh, of the either oncology uh, professional association or also the chief um, uh, oncologist at the Ministry of Health. I no. Hope. No? No. So That's sorry. not correct. Sorry. <laughs> so that was then a slight, uh, slight mistake, but nevertheless she would deserve definitely this. Uh, so we do have uh, four distinguished uh, presentations during the meeting and we hope that really uh, m many more people than currently in the audience are following us uh, online. So we would encourage really the questions either here on the floor in the, in the room or, or online as well. But really to be on time and that's what we would request also to try the speakers to keep the time. We would start with the first speaker that uh, is uh, Katarina uh, Pouko on uh, the IMPRESS uh, Norway trial implementing precision medicine in Norway. We are really looking forward to hear on the situation since we, 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 we have heard a lot of about how the Comprehensive Cancer Center has been established in Norway. So we are really looking forward. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will talk about implementing precision, medicine, precision cancer medicine in, in Norway. Uh, so, uh, when we started uh, this, uh, when we started in 2019, we, we really had just a small uh, gene panels and, and we had to decide what to do, how to start. So, uh, it was very obvious to, uh, to begin with uh, infrastructure for precision medicine with the diagnostics first. And then after that, of course, uh, we, we also uh, decided to start a clinical trial in PRESS Norway, ensuring that the patients uh, got the access uh, to the medications as well. We started some other projects. I won't go uh, too much into details uh, here, but I will mention them briefly. So we started, our first initiative was to summon uh, the hematologist, the oncologist uh, and the pathologist, the experts from all of the, the Norway. Uh, we decided to go nationally to, to make this a national initiative. So, so we did agree on some uh, a few but common priorities and we aligned this with top uh, down. We talked to health, uh, health authorities and uh, agreed on, on what to prioritize and this released of course uh, and uh, a lot of funding uh, uh, being, uh, being us then uh, making us, uh, uh, giving us the position to, to make this uh, really work and, and, uh, and uh, in practice. Uh, then we did the international scoping. We identified the drop trial in the Netherlands and the other trials uh, starting at the same time, precision medicine trials in all the countries, in Denmark, Sweden, uh, Finland. And we aligned uh, with them uh, making a drop network. We started dialogue with the industry uh, and uh, industry partners and formed a public-private collaboration connect group. And of course, in parallel, we also had to discuss uh, the ethics uh, the regulatives, health economics, IT, uh, and, and other things. So all this, uh, we, we started doing this at the same time. So what, did it, what did it, we did first was starting with the diagnostics, and we are really happy uh, to, to say that uh, uh, TSU 500 is a part of public healthcare in Norway. And we, of course, had to start slowly. We started with sequencing two patients a week and, and then increasing. And uh, what we, this basically means that every patient diagnosed with malignant disease in Norway has the access or the possibility will have the access for TSU 500 and this is reimbursed. We do the molecular profiling uh, and create uh, the molecular reports and these reports are then uh, assessed in the molecular tumor meetings. So what we did in parallel uh, is having a hybrid activity 
between the uh, public health and research. We designed the IMPRESS trial in that way that uh, every patient that is getting the molecular pro profiling signs the informed consent. We do some uh, IMPRESS specific analysis like circulating uh, DNA, but all, the, all the, the, the reports created and then discussed in the molecular tumor board, uh, we, we reached the decision about either including in the IMPRESS trial, some other clinical trials or early access programs or going back to if the patient doesn't have any biomarkers or are not eligible for the trials, they go to standard of care uh, or, or, or basically a best supportive care. Uh, in, uh, if the patient is included in, uh, in the IMPRESS trial, we also do the extensive biobanking, uh, additional sampling, whole genome sequencing and, and other things. But this is really important for us that we have the hybrid activity between the public health and, and the, uh, the research. So how our reports uh, look like, uh, we have uh, the patient is, uh, we present this at our molecular tumor boards, it's really focused about, uh, on this report. We have in the middle uh, the, the uh, patient identifier, the trial number, this is the impressed trial number. We report uh, alteration in prote protein coding sequences, copy number variants, gene fusions, uh, everything as, as mentioned before, and in the middle you see the clinical interpretation of, uh, of the of the variants and this is all this is all these reports are in English if in case patient will be eligible for a clinical trial either uh, in, in Norway or outside the Norway so it's uh, easier to, for patients to, to use this. We have, I, don't, I won't go into details about this one, but we structured our uh, uh, tumor board, the molecular tumor board in a way, uh, in a Dutch way. We have uh, the representative from uh, the oncologist, pathologist, geneticist, biologist and bioinformatician. Everybody is prepared in advance and we, dis we discuss all our patients and, and uh, we always have the clinician treating the patient uh, present and the, the molecular uh, tumor board is virtual. And everybody can join from all the country. So a little bit more about the IMPRESS Norway trial. Uh, this is the trial uh, that includes all patients with a solid tumor as, and hematological malignancies. We have the collaboration with the DROP and the trial is designed in a similar manner. We uh, enter the patients by performing a 500 gene panel, TSO 500. All the patients are evaluated and discussed in the, in the National Molecular Tumor Board. And if we, we find a target and, uh, and, the, and have a drug match, then the patient is included in the trial. We feed all our data in the, uh, the cancer registry of Norway, and, and this enables uh, us also, uh, and we can also retrieve the data from the cancer registry, enabling us to have the data on the long-term follow-up and, and, and generating synthetic cohorts and, and different things. So the trial is national. We have uh, 18 uh, centers, and this is all, all department, all hospitals with their oncology centers. Uh, uh, oncology center are participating, both in the molecular uh, tumor boards and in the trial. And this is really uh, helping us to build the infrastructure for the future trials as well. We couldn't have done this uh, without the funding. We have the funding. We are supported both from the health authorities, from the cancer society, and, and from the industry as well. The trial is designed, uh, it's a combined uh, umbrella and basket trial as a, as a classical semen two-stage model, meaning that we identify the patients with the actionable target based on the molecular analysis. We match the target with the drug, uh, and, uh, and the patient, if the patient is, is eligible for inclusion, then we create a cohort. We have stage one cohorts uh, first, uh, including eight patients, and if, we, if you have response uh, in at least uh, one of the patients, then we expand to stage two and stage three. At the moment, we have uh, mostly cohort one, uh, stage one cohorts, but we have also one stage three. This is a collaboration with the DROP uh, trial. So just to show you some numbers, uh, uh, we started, we opened uh, and started profiling patients in April last year. And uh, until the end of August this year, we profiled 500 uh, patients uh, and, and discussed most of them in the, our national uh, tumor board. 
And we, uh, as we, you see here, 24 of the patients that were discussed were included in the press uh, trial. 2% uh, were included in other clinical trials, and 10% were referred to early access or compassionate use program, meaning basically that 36% uh, of the patients that were profiled had uh, a new oppor opportunity of new drug and new treatment. And f uh, of the patients included in Impress Norway, 107 patients totally are, are uh, uh, included. Uh, of them, 73 started the treatment. This is mainly because the, the rest of the patients is still receiving, stand uh, receiving standard of care. Uh, we include patients in many different cohorts. We have uh, uh, different cancer types, and we have 17 drugs we, 17 drugs we use in, uh, in Impress. Uh, we see here uh, that uh, uh, 57 of the patients had uh, more than 16 weeks of treatment and had uh, their first uh, or, uh, evaluation, and 50% and of them had either complete uh, response, partial response of stable disease. Uh, it means 50% of the patients included has had clinical, uh, clinical benefit of the treatment. So this is a swimmer plot. Everybody showed a nice uh, patient uh, cases. Uh, this, these are the patients included in the uh, impress. You see on the top one patient with the complete response. This is a glioblastoma with the BRAF mutation. And uh, you see down there uh, the number of the weeks on treatment. He had the complete response and now he's, uh, it's, uh, he's on treatment for more than one year. We have some patients having partial response. Uh, most of the patients have stable disease, but as you see here, there are some patients with durable uh, stable disease, meaning that they really have the clinical benefit of, of the treatment. So what we aim to do in the future, or, or we are already starting uh, that, we, we are the part of the DROP uh, network. There are similar trials, as I mentioned, in Denmark, uh, Finland and Sweden. They are also starting the similar trial in France and, and the UK. And we have a similar, uh, or we have aligned our primary and secondary endpoints and hoping to aggregate the data and really make the clinical, uh, the clinical impact, you know, not just including A patients in small cohorts, but aggregating data and, 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 and creating clinically meaningful, meaningful data. So just to, to, to show you how we uh, started again, we started by, uh, by the diagnostics, which is the part of public health care. We designed a trial uh, to, to ensure that the patients uh, uh, get the, the, medications, uh, the med medications they need. But we also incorporated some of the research in the, in the impress, and now we are we just recently opened uh, the National uh, Center for uh, Clinical Cancer Research, where we are planning to continue this work. We are uh, going further and, and starting uh, new novel diagnostics, uh, diagnostic methods, artificial intelligence solutions. We will try uh, to start uh, new trials. And, and we are hoping to, 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 to have the possibility for more extensive biobanking and translational research. Uh, what I think was really important for us that we have created working groups uh, and we collaborate uh, with the private stakeholders. We have the uh, different working groups uh, for the diagnostics for the uh, clinical trials. This is, uh, made it, this is the working group that IMPRESS is, is holding. And we have uh, the, the working group for regulatory framework for implementation. And then we are all, of course, working together on data government storage and, and, and data sharing. So the key learnings from, from uh, our perspective is that it, for us it was really what, what showed to, to make the big impact was that, that we took, uh, we, we, we ch chose to do this uh, nationally, we, we were taking the national lead. It enabled us to, to structure the field of precision cancer uh, medicine in whole Norway. Uh, it was very important to, to include clinicians, diagnosticians, and uh, researchers from all the country. It was very important uh, with the uh, public-private partnership. Uh, this is uh, an, an understanding how things work, both for the for the private uh, stakeholders and, and, uh, and public. Of course, we needed to, to think about health economy and uh, reimbursement uh, for clinicians and research 
matters of course policy and politics uh, is, uh, is a difficult but, but uh, we managed to do that and we created the high expectations and, and of course we, we need to meet uh, these expectations. Uh, we got a lot of attention recently on, uh, this year because this is a national uh, wide initiative and it, it's quite unique. So this is uh, how we th see about things in future. We, of course, uh, impress, uh, in Impress Trial, we really have more companies and, and, and more drugs available. Uh, we, uh, the Impress Trial will outlive the, the individual drugs, so we rotate drugs in and out. Uh, we want to, uh, to design more, uh, more uh, new trials, we want to, to, to establish new diagnostics, we want to integrate the artificial intelligence-based approach, we want to move forward in treatment lines, and, and by, build, by doing this nationally, we are building uh, the infrastructure and, and the capacity uh, of, of uh, conducting clinical trials in whole of Norway, and this field is rapidly moving, so we have to adapt on the way. And this is last, my last slide. This is like a lot of names and just show, uh, wanting to show you these are all the people that contributed uh, and, and that are really working together to make this thing possible. You have there you have the representative for all, from all the hospitals in Norway, the representative from the industry, uh, from, the, uh, from the authorities and everybody's working together making, making this a successful story. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah, congratulations with this achievement. And uh, actually, to say that Nor Norway is a very large country if to compare to Latvia. So, if you have managed to cover the country, that is great. Actually, I had a question in this respect uh, since um, you mentioned the cooperation to clinical studies across Europe. But what is the current status? And as we know, it is initiative to cooperate the clinical studies within the Nordic countries and possibly also involving Baltic states. So mm. what, is, what is the state of this, the state of, uh, status of this collaboration? Yeah, we recently applied for a European grant and we are hoping to, to take the lead in, in, in uh, really data uh, to, to lead this initiative to, to aggregate it, uh, the data and, and, and to make it possible to share the data. Uh, of course, we have some regulative issues with that, and, and that's, that's the main problem. Uh, uh, the willingness to do that is, is there. And of course, if you are uh, thinking about uh, starting the same, uh, same type of trial in uh, Latvia, we are very open to sharing everything we have, with all our meetings, the connect meetings, everything is open for, 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 uh, for participants. You know, we, don't have, we, we are very happy to share that. But, but uh, 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 aggregating the data, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the regulations uh, that, that uh, are currently stopping us. But if, if, we, if uh, we get the, 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 the support from the EU, it will be much easier. Thank you. There's a question over there. Yes, thank you so much. Very impressive presentation. And uh, I'm representing Lithuania. So I wanted to ask, do you see this project at, at the moment as a background for outcome-based or paper for performance or, or, or how, how, because you mentioned that at 16 weeks you are measuring the response and that about half of the patients are benefiting. So is it currently kind of linked to this scheme or do you see that it could be in, in the future? I mean that government is taking over the funding once there is a response, because I understand that these are kind of experimental, yeah. not, not have been proved in the clinical trials. At the moment, we have the agreement for stage three expansion cohorts that uh, uh, the industry is, is uh, they are financing the treatment until the six, week 16 evaluation. And if the patient has a response that the, uh, the treatment is reimbursed by the government. So, so, so this is the first part, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, if we are going to aggregate the data, and, and uh, hopefully with the help of the EU, we, we, we are really hoping to make the impact and, and for the industry also to register these drugs uh, uh, based on this data, because phase three studies or big studies are never going to happen in this, in this setting. So, so we are really hoping to aggregate the data, making the clinical impact and making the possible to get uh, to, to get reimbursement for the drugs as well.
Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, let's thank the speaker once more. We thank have you. to move uh, to the Forward. next presentation. Yes, and our next speaker would be, will be Vilja Pietinainen, team leader and senior scientist at the Institute for Molecular Medicine, Finland. Welcome. Okay, um, great to be here, first of all, and thank you for the organizers. It's been a very fruitful uh, meeting full with, uh, f filled with discussions and, uh, and yeah, very happy to be here in Riga. Okay, so um, I jumped uh, maybe from the patients uh, more closely to the, to the cells, which you can actually see here, uh, some uh, cancer cells, uh, spheroids, uh, uh, going to the drug testing on our side and, and coming directly from the, from the uh, pediatric cancer patient, uh, cancer tissue sample. So uh, I would like to introduce you uh, to uh, very shortly to a few projects which we've been uh, working on now. Uh, some of them are newer, uh, and, and some uh, we have uh, for some of them we have worked actually quite long at FEM, uh, at the Institute for Molecular Medicine, Finland, and uh, we have um, this functional precision medicine. Um, uh, in cancer as a kind of film, one of film grand challenges. And there we've been originally setting it for, uh, for leukemias, but then more lately to the solid tumors, which I will talk to you more about today. Then uh, we are also involved uh, heavily in ICANN flagship, uh, which is the digital precision cancer medicine for discoveries and improved treatments uh, 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 study. Uh, and I will also introduce that shortly. We also have been uh, members, uh, partners in Compass Era Permit, where we want to standardize the bank, uh, European functional image-based drug testing for pediatric solid tumors. And I will show you some of the very kind of fresh results uh, submitted very lately to the journal. So all of this actually needs a collaboration, very close collaboration together with clinics, pharma and uh, pharma companies, as well as the biotech. And of course, there's a, a huge requirement of the infrastructures, which we've been he uh, hearing uh, during this, um, um, this meeting as well. And uh, we are quite lucky, lucky at FEM that we have actually a, a local technology center where we can, for example, perform, the, perform genomics uh, and, and functional drug testing studies. And, uh, and what actually combines all of these precision medicine studies we do at FEM is the functional drug testing. So on top of the uh, genetic alterations and looking, uh, looking for example, the transcriptomics data, we think that we need additional layers to really understand what's ongoing in the cancer tissue in these particular patients. And, uh, and let's see, yeah. So here you can see actually the flow of functional drug profiling. Uh, we basically make these uh, drug plates, they can be the ready-made plates. Uh, we can use the drug plates with uh, over 500 compounds, but if we have a limited amount of the sample, we then just have, uh, have uh, fewer, uh, fewer drugs. Uh, for example, for the pediatric cancers, uh, we are currently screening around uh, uh, 80 to uh, 120 drugs. We basically get the freshly, uh, um, well, we get the fresh sample, the fresh tissue sample directly from the uh, surgery, well, it goes first to the pathologist uh, who will define the cancer or tumor cell content and give us the piece of the tissue, which we then uh, further make it as a cell suspension in our research lab and either as a freshly isolated cells or, or, or as a cell culture. If we need to expand the cells, we feed these cells uh, using automation and robotics. We have our, our hydrogen biomedicine um, core unit uh, to these pre uh, plates where we have uh, drugs in the kind of clinically relevant concentrations, five different concentrations up to seven. We can also test combinations here if needed. Uh, we then incubate the cells with the drugs for dependent, depending on the drugs, but typically for three days. Uh, we can measure the cell viability, but we also use the microscopic readouts, which I will come back to later, to measure the drug activity in these particular uh, cancer cells. And then uh, we analyze this uh, data uh, in Breeze, which is our in-house tool, but it's also open source tool, so anybody can uh, find it uh, by Googling. So there we have the quality control, which is extremely important, of course, for such screens uh, to look, for example, um, 
the performance of our controls in the screens. Uh, and then uh, we get so-called uh, DSS score, which is a drug resistance and sensitivity score. Um, um, I mean, we can also use ICEC 50s, but this is a bit better in our, in our, in our um, studies to kind of uh, then also enabling the comparison between different patients and screens. And what we uh, then want to do is that we actually give this as a part of the report to the molecular tumor board as a patient-specific drug uh, response profiling. Uh, this is um, a slide I, I'm not going, <laughs> going to go very uh, deeply through, but I just want to highlight uh, how uh, this whole uh, functional precision medicine has worked in leukemias. Uh, this uh, was published uh, in the very beginning of this year, uh, Cancer Discovery, and it's a huge teamwork uh, by many researchers at FIM and, and the local hospital. And uh, here the functional precision medicine guided therapy actually led to successful responses in uh, almost 60% of the relapsed or refractory AML patients. And uh, we believe that ex vivo drug sensitivity testing, DSRT, is very informative. And uh, it's also actionable, at least here, with the AM AML uh, patients, so uh, in, in the treatment of the patients, because these findings were actually applied to, to, the, to the treatment of the patients. And, uh, and uh, also, we think that we can provide actionable data much faster than many other, other type of the omics, just as genomics or transcriptomics profiling. And, and, and of course, this is uh, giving a rapid response back to the patient treatments. Uh, this is another example uh, uh, from a senior scientist in our, our research group, uh, Astrid Murumaki, who's been working, uh, working a lot with a different uh, uh, type of the ovarian cancer patient samples and the drug testing, plus other type of the, of the profiling, molecular profiling. And here, uh, before the functional uh, precision, um, so you can see here, before the functional precision oncology, uh, uh, the, the, the patient was uh, doing, um, or the, the cancer was proceeding in this patient and uh, uh, despite of the different type of the treatments given. Uh, then uh, the clinician wanted to se send these samples for the, uh, of the tissue, cancer tissue samples for the characterization in our lab. And, and there was the uh, kind of larger functional precision oncology strategy used again here. And, and there was actually a fusion gene um, in, R, in RG1, which is found. And um, it is actually clinically targetable. And by the drug testing, it was also found that certain uh, uh, inhibitors of the um, ETFR family were actually uh, effective on the patient-derived cancer cells. And again, not going more into the details, but, uh, but, uh, but we've been getting a few other samples from this particular patient have been tuning the treatment, but it's still based on uh, these original findings uh, by using this methodology and, and the patient had been uh, doing uh, well for, for several years. And there was also the, uh, not the complete, but uh, anyway, the disappearance uh, of, the, of the tumor. Okay, and then to the ICANN flagship. So uh, ICANN flagship project is actually a huge project funded by Academia Finland. And it's linking the tumor molecular profiling uh, to our health data, digital health data, longitudinal and, and clinical data. And the idea is, of course, uh, that we will make new discoveries by combining all this data. And of course, machine learning uh, is, is here uh, in a big role. So we basically do the same what we've been doing at FIM earlier, but here we have 15 sub-projects currently, and there may be even more projects coming up in the uh, beginning of next year. But we have different, uh, different types of the cancers. I myself involved in the urological cancers, like adult cancers uh, project, and then on the pediatric uh, solid tumor project, which we uh, established together with a local uh, a new children hospital, and Yuka was actually giving a talk here yesterday. So uh, we collect, again, different type of the data of the patients, clinical data, other type of the data, but we also collect, of course, the samples. There's a deep profiling, which we do in our research uh, labs, but then there's also, uh, also a so-called basic or general profiling, which includes uh, uh, exome sequencing of, uh, um, of all the tumor samples plus the germline. Uh, for the germline and, and somatic mutations, plus there's a transcriptomics, uh, so the RNA is isolated. And this part is actually performed uh, partially with, the, with, the, with Helsinki Biobank, uh, which we heard about um, more yesterday. 
and, uh, and all this data is, is actually then combined to this ICANN discovery platform, so it's, it's basically um, uh, very closely located to the, um, to the hospital data lake system, and we are able to actually uh, also put a different type of the clinical data there and, and, and combine it there. And we, of course, hope that this unique setup could enable some break, uh, true discoveries. But in our own project, we are more interested uh, in then uh, to really uh, translate the results back to the patients as well. I'm not now, because of uh, uh, lack of the time, go very much uh, through ICANN flagship, but uh, there's, a, there's a web page of the ICANN if you're interested in. And, uh, and uh, I know that there's uh, always, if, if somebody wants to contact us, we can, uh, or I can, um, uh, Hedge Tommy Makela is very happy to, to tell more about the project. And I think that I, I went mostly this too. Uh, interesting thing is that we uh, expect that there would be three petabytes of the data uh, by 2026. And this will be, of course, uh, the big thing to combine this data, integrate it, and, and, and how to kind of make all the data functional at the end. And, and also want to kind of emphasize here that we uh, have actually the board of the patients in, in ICANN, ICANN and, and they are also following our projects. So this is very, very good to have those people we're actually working for uh, involved. Okay, so um, then uh, we were actually uh, wanted to have uh, new therapy options also for the children with solid tumors after the, what we learned from the leukemias and, and, and other uh, adult tumors we've been, uh, we've been um, uh, uh, doing research on. So uh, we first established um, Compass Consortium, which is the Euro European um, project, and then I will also shortly prepare, uh, introduce you to the PREPARE and ICANN BEDI, which are associated projects in Finland. So uh, there are many current challenges which we've been discussing here um, during these two days in, in precision medicine for pediatric cancers, but all type of the cancers. And uh, many challenges, I'm not going to go them through now, specifically, we all know them, I guess. Uh, but um, we basically believe that, um, that uh, by utilizing this uh, kind of cutting edge technologies, which we have, which we have heard about uh, here, we can actually, by different combinations of those, respond to these challenges. We just, of course, then also need a collaboration with, uh, with other groups when we talk about the pedi uh, pediatric cancers, quite rare cancers. But anyway, we believe that by, by kind of combining different technologies and the uh, scientific expertise, we can kind of um, do this streamlined, fast sample delivery um, analysis and also return these results back to the clinics in addition, making science or new discoveries, understanding better how certain type of the cancer is actually um, uh, biologically functioning. So we, uh, we asked the question whether we actually uh, could, with a standardized uh, functional precision medicine, bring some uh, benefit to the children with solid tumors. And uh, uh, here is actually already a published study uh, between uh, local uh, clinicians and our group. Uh, I wasn't involved yet at that time myself, but there was actually one compassionate case patient, uh, patient and, uh, and, uh, and, and there was, uh, again, the drug testing done for this particular patient, and at the end, uh, based on these results, as well as other molecular profiling findings in the, in the diagnostic lab, uh, the patient uh, was successfully treated, uh, treated and, uh, and this was a I'm, again, not going very deep into the project, but just want to say that that was a proof of concept study for us. We thought that, okay, uh, uh, there's a great collaboration uh, established and, and maybe we should go further, further with this uh, as well locally, because we had already now set up this uh, kind of uh, uh, standardized drug testing in the COMPASS uh, consortium, which is clinical implementation of multidimensional phenotypical drug sensitivities in pediatric precision oncology. And it's actually strongly linked with other established uh, pediatric precision oncology uh, programs or registry studies, such as INFORM, which we've been hearing about here, MAPI acts, acts and ITER. And INFORM has uh, also been piloting now the COMPASS uh, for the patient tissue samples, which have been sent to Heidelberg from different uh, uh, hospitals uh, in Europe. And the aim is to, to screen, again, using functional drug testing, uh, around 300 pediatric uh, cancer patients uh, by the end of the, end of the, the project. And, and this is, of course, for the relapsed solid tumors. 
So uh, what we've been working at FIM is to standardize this whole drug functional drug testing. So we've been establishing a bit new type of the assay. Uh, so as said, we use very freshly uh, isolated cancer cells, and we actually do the drug testing in the 3D format so that the cells are a bit more like phys physiologically maybe in the format that they are resembling the original tumor tissue where they are derived from. And here you can just see small organoids treated, uh, or spheroids, I would say so, uh, treated with different drugs uh, on this 384 well plate. And um, there are also PDX models, uh, but they are tested uh, at the Institute Curie by their, um, by their researchers. So the main things are that there's a short propagation of the cells or no propagation. We try to do it as fresh as possible. And we have this compass ready to go drug plates, which we then ship to other countries as well. And, and, uh, and then we also work here with the microscopic readouts because we believe that imaging readouts where we can get to the single cell level by imaging, we can also reveal the residual population, cell population, which is actually a resistant to the treatment. And this is a very, very uh, fresh data, uh, has been now resubmitted uh, to the, uh, the re revised version of the manuscript uh, to, uh, to NPG um, Precision Oncology. But basically, there's been uh, 132 uh, viable tumor samples from uh, 35 pediatric oncology centers uh, submitted to the informed study. And uh, the overall mean processing time has been three weeks. Uh, uh, um, there's been uh, certain uh, cases which didn't pass the quality control, and of course there's been the shipment, uh, which is not always a good thing for the, for the living tissue. But anyway, uh, how the drug testing results uh, looked like, they actually matched with the identified molecular targets uh, in these particular patients, which were uh, defined at inform otherwise through genomics and, and, and also some rna -seq. And also, I want to point out that the drug vulnerabilities were identified in 80% of the cases lacking actionable high evidence, molecular events. So this actually adds the value to the molecular data. And we think that this is also feasible in international multicenter precision oncology programs. But then we also wanted to set this uh, up locally just to avoid also the shipping of the tumor tissue and of course uh, make it even faster in our, our case. And, um, and now uh, we have many things ongoing uh, with a local new children hospital uh, in Helsinki. And we hope also at some point to expand this uh, to be a more, uh, more national, uh, national study in Finland. But uh, basically, uh, we do the deep molecular profiling of, of the patient cancer tissue and patient derived cancer cells, ex vivo functional assays. We also now want to add the pharmacogenomics on top of this. Uh, we think that it should be carried out to all, all, the, all the patients and it's already partially ongoing in the clinics. And then uh, we also uh, developing the integrative molecular tumor pod so that we could actually make this type of the report we just heard about uh, in the previous presentation uh, back to the clinicians treating the patients. And we are actually currently testing uh, different systems. We've been hearing uh, here, uh, one from Sweden, uh, Cancer Core Europe Molecular Tumor port, uh, Portal, then one from Nor Norway, uh, also MTP Pilot from Zurich, and, and then a few, um, uh, few ones uh, also from the company side, uh, which have been actually mentioned here as well. But this is something what we are now building up within the ICANN and also for the pediatric cancers. So as a conclusion, I, I think that it's, uh, it's quite, quite much to say that maybe we should have the cure of the cancer as a future goal, but maybe it's actually possible that we would at least have much longer term uh, remission if we're talking about uh, some adult cancers and, 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 and really like improve the ter therapies and find the new uh, and earlier diagnosis. And this of course needs a dialogue with the hospital. And I'm a researcher myself, a biochemist, uh, not with a clinical background, but I think it's been great to, to, um, to collaborate with the clinicians as well as the technology experts to really set this uh, type of the programs up and ongoing. And, and, and of course, at the end, we want to kind of acknowledge that there has to be the impact on patients and on the society and want to thank everybody participating in this study. And of course, uh, first of all, uh, the patients and their, their parents when coming to the pediatric cancers. And thanks. Thank you, excellent presentation. Do we have any questions from audience? Yes.
Yeah, hi. Um, I'm from um, UK, so I present the University of Manchester, Welcome Sangren Institute, and uh, University of Cambridge. So we, we did something similar um, in a way of um, screening the drugs, but in uh, to the um, cell cultures essentially with the fibroblasts. And I was just wondering, how do you deal, first of all, with the um, um, patient's patient variability? And um, uh, because you're screening quite a lot of compounds, like more than 100 compounds I saw in your presentation. So for, first of all, it's going to be quite a lot of variability between different individuals, spe specifically because tumors are quite uh, diverse in mutations and things like that. And they, uh, second of all, have you considered um, also looking at LCMS, MS, like um, mass spectrometry approaches to see whether the translational effects of the RNA sequencing is translated in proteomics as well? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, if, if I, if I uh, understood it correctly, so uh, yeah, so there are, uh, of course, uh, differences between the patients, that's what we are looking for. Uh, we also have been now running a kind of body-wise control set of, of, of the healthy tissues. So we have our healthy healthy cancer cells, or sorry, healthy, healthy, healthy cells from the, uh, both from the kind of pediatric healthy cases, but then also uh, from the adults and of course in leukemias, uh, then there's the healthy bone marrow samples, which we've been running as a control. So we try to control so that we have, and we can also uh, compare with the different uh, data from also now from the other uh, studies uh, at our unit. So this, this kind of helps to kind of find out what is the general toxicity of the drugs. Uh, there are certain drugs which are always toxic. And then there are, of course, certain drugs which don't, uh, uh, are not that functional in our setup. So then uh, we are not looking at those, but we are, for example, uh, developing the complex organoids to look more of the uh, immuno-oncological therapies. Uh, to the second thing, yes, we are thinking to add on proteomics and and things like that, but I think uh, not at the moment uh, in the pediatric cancer side, in the other uh, tumors, uh, people are already working on those, but not with the, uh, yeah. So uh, we've been discussing with a few groups and, and, and actually, uh, yeah, there are some uh, plans for the proteomics, but we haven't gone there yet. And, and, and for drugs, do you use different concentrations as well, uh, or is it just a certain concentration? Yes, it's always five, uh, yeah, five up to seven concentrations of the drugs uh, each drug. Thank you. I think we have to move to the next two presentations. It will be um, uh, uh, Thomas uh, Hofmacher, the research director at the IHA on the uh, value of precision medicine in oncology, the case presentation on a non-small cell lung cancer. Right, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Great, wonderful. Well, it's, it's a, it's a, you cannot see me. No, no we can oh, see Yes. You. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, no, okay. Great. So let me also share my screen. I have prepared a, a short, very short presentation for you. So let me share that. I hope we can see it in a few seconds. Great. So, um, thank you very much for the short introduction. So, my name is Thomas Hofmacher. I'm a health economist and research director at the Swedish Institute for Health Economics. And, uh, well, as our, our name says, we, we do a lot of uh, work on, on health economics. So, this is why uh, the aim of today is to talk a little bit about the value or the health economic value of precision medicine in uh, oncology, and I will illustrate my, my points based on, a, on the example of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and I, I really hope that I, I can convey this message of value to you. I mean, uh, you know, from a clinical side, it's, it's important to understand the science of precision medicines, to identify biomarkers, to development treatments uh, that work. But in the end, when you want to implement something in clinical practice, it's super important also to know of, of, of the health economic value because new technologies um, cost money. Uh, someone has to pay for them. So knowing about the costs and the benefits is crucial. Um, and let me, sh let me start my presentation by just showing you one picture of what we mean actually by value in, in healthcare. So value is usually defined as the health outcomes that we achieve with a new intervention uh, in relation to the cost of this new intervention. And not just the cost of the intervention itself, so the cost of a new 
um, testing technology or, or of a new treatment, but actually uh, all the costs in the healthcare sector that are affected by, by the new technology that you are trying to introduce, but then also indirect costs uh, outside the healthcare system, because you might have effects of, of a new kind of treatment that affect people's ability to work. Um, and that too are costs that matter in a consideration when we talk about the value of a new, um, a new technology, a new intervention in healthcare. So if you don't like the diffraction that is shown on the left-hand side, just look at the scale on, on the right-hand side. So basically value is about, uh, about health on the one side and about the costs uh, on the other side. We need to find a good balance between the health uh, outcomes that we can achieve with something new and the costs it takes uh, for this new intervention to be implemented uh, and, and all spin-off effects of this new intervention. That, that's what's value in, in healthcare. And uh, when it comes to precision medicines, then specifically in oncology, and when we think about the value, um, I believe there are four key features shown here in this uh, four blue boxes that are generally um, voiced in, in debates, let's call it that way. Uh, so the first one would be that precision medicine may increase the efficiency of, of care delivery. So this is usually framed under the title, giving the right kind of medicine to the right patient at the right time. And the other one uh, is that precision medicines may improve health outcomes. So improve the survival of patients or treatment related adverse events go down, um, health related quality of life goes up uh, and so on. And in generally for these first two boxes at the top, there is broad evidence in the literature that uh, precision, precision medicine does just that. Uh, where we are a bit more struggling when it comes to the, the amount of, of evidence we have uh, on precision medicine is, is whenever we talk about the costs. So the, the third box says that precision medicine may decrease overall healthcare costs because the cost for testing and for the medicines will go up if they're new. And if, if, if there's no testing being done before, then introducing testing will inevitably increase costs. Uh, but then also medicines costs will probably go up because you have new treatments coming in that are replacing all the treatments that might already be off patent and off patent medicines are much cheaper than you know, newer on patent medicines. Uh, but then these increases might be offset by decreases in, in other kinds of costs. And I will get back to that later on in my presentation. Um, precision medicine may also decrease non-healthcare costs. So these are indirect costs, costs outside the healthcare system. Uh, which could be public payments for people being on sick leave uh, or having to retire early. Um, because if we can improve the health outcomes, then maybe sick leaves go down uh, or the likelihood for patients to have to retire early uh, goes down and that saves money. So these kinds of cost considerations are important, not so much evidence. Um, and um, we have done, I'll, I'll show you two, two research projects that we have that we have been working on in the, in the past two years. Uh, and the first one is about trying to illustrate what are we missing out on if we don't implement biomarker testing and precision medicine. And uh, both, both of the examples are on, on non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, a lot of things have been going on uh, specifically with non-small cell lung cancer, um, where we have moved from the, the light blue bubble to the very left, where we have in the past 15 years ago treated non-small cell lung cancer really just as one disease. Everyone received chemotherapy, um, but that was it. And then we understood that there are histolo histologically based subtypes. Um, at the beginning, we just knew it, but the, we actually didn't have any treatments to target these, these subtypes. And then we also realized that, well, Actually, there are many uh, oncogenic drivers uh, in, in these subtypes, in all of them actually. Uh, and you see at the, the pie chart to the very right, uh, different kinds of oncogenic drivers that have been identified in, in non-small cell lung cancer. So knowledge about non-small cell lung cancer and its drivers has really exploded over the past two, two decades. And for some of these, or I should say for many of these uh, drivers, now there are treatments available that, uh, that target these drivers. Uh, 
but not for all of them shown here on, on these pictures, we actually have, have treatments available. Um, and, and sort of based on this notion of what we have seen in the past 20 years in an upcoming analysis that we will present in more detail in, in just a few weeks at the ISPOR Europe conference in Vienna, I, I can show you just a, a sneak peek of, um, of the kind of analysis uh, and some of the outcomes uh, that, we, that we have in this, in this study. So we looked at, at biomarker testing and the first line treatment of advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, we essentially tried to follow the picture that it, you saw before with these uh, pie charts. Um, so in, we, have scenario, we have two scenarios. In scenario one, we assume no testing, uh, so no biomarker testing for oncogenic drivers, no pdl one testing. So that was the situation essentially um, around 2005 in, in Europe. No testing was done because there were no, no treatments available uh, that would have called for testing. So that means every, every patient got chemotherapy. Um, but in scenario two, we, we look at uh, multi-gene testing. So here we assume that patients get NGS testing uh, and also pdl one testing. Uh, and that means we can administer precision medicine. So you see at the bottom uh, uh, seven oncogenic drivers for which treatments are already available, um, at least globally. They're not available in every country. Uh, uh, certainly not in Europe, but there are treatments available for all of these seven um, uh, drivers uh, at the bottom of, of, the, of the second bar. They account for around 30% of all cases of non-small cell lung cancer in, at, at least in the European population. In East Asia, it would look different. Uh, there we can already target 50% of the local population, but in, in, in Europe, it's around 30%. The remaining 70% uh, would receive either immunotherapy as a monotherapy if they are, have a high expression of pdl one and otherwise they receive a combination of immunotherapy and, and chemotherapy. So that, that's sort of the latest, that's, the, that's how far we, we are at the moment in, in clinical practice when it comes to treating advanced non-small cell lung cancer in first line, I should say. And uh, I'll show you two slides now on the health outcomes and the costs. Let's start with the health outcomes. Um, so we looked at different measures. One of them was the five-year absolute survival rate. And uh, I'm showing you the results for two countries. I'm showing you results for Germany and for Poland. And um, the, the, the black bar is for a note testing scenario and the blue bar is for the multi-gene testing scenario that I just explained on the slide before. And what you see is that, well, in in the absence of any testing, so with no testing, the black bars, we have had extremely low uh, survival rates in, in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, according to our modeling study, 2%. So 98% so uh, die, unfortunately, after five years. So it's, it's extremely bad outcomes, but lung cancer is one of the most challenging uh, cancer types that we, that we have. But we see that with multi-gene testing, we would see a six-fold increase in the five-year survival rate to around 13%. So going from 2% to 13%. Now, 13% is, of course, still a million miles away from 100%. So there's still a big uh, unmet need. But, you know, instead of one, of one out of 50 patients surviving, now, we're at, or now we could be at one out of eight. So that's, that's, that's a, lot, uh, a lot better. Um, and apart from survival, we also looked at um, adverse events. Uh, and we do find there is actually a, a significant decrease also in the number of adverse events when we move from no testing to multi-gene testing um, because these newer precision medicines are, they have a different side effects profile, but overall uh, they have uh, fewer uh, side effects, even though we're treating patients for a longer time, I should say. So I think that's quite uh, that's quite quite an interesting result. So not just patients live longer, but also better. Um, and then we also looked at the costs because we need for in order to understand the value, health outcomes are important, but the costs are also important. Uh, and when we looked at the costs per patient, uh, again for Germany and Poland, we see that well in Germany treating a patient with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. 
uh, with no testing is already over 100,000 US dollars. Uh, but with multi-chain testing, it will increase by about 50%. Uh, and in Poland, the overall numbers are lower. So treating a patient with no testing is around 60,000 US dollars, but then uh, introducing multi-chain testing and all of the new treatments that come with it would increase the costs by uh, 74%. Um, and of course, uh, that's, that's a lot, uh, the cost increase in absolute terms in US dollars. But if you compare it to what you can achieve for um, increases in the survival rates that I've shown you before, the six, six fold increase in survival rates, um, the reduction in, in adverse events, you see that, you know, when you, when you think back of the scale that I showed you at the very beginning, it's always a balance between costs and, and health outcomes. So you, it's up to, to decision makers then to decide, is this a good balance? Yes, yes or no. Um, and we looked also into much more detail actually when it comes to the costs, because the picture shown on the left really just shows you the overall picture for when we sum up all healthcare costs and non-healthcare costs that we include in the study. But if you look at the individual costs, components on the uh, on the right hand side you see that well test costs they go up when you switch from no testing to testing because with no testing there is no cost for testing um, medicines costs also go up because in non-small cell lung cancer we really see that we are replacing chemotherapy which has been around for decades and is off patent and very cheap with new kinds of treatment that are on patent and, and hence uh, uh, much more expensive than, than chemotherapy. So that drives up the cost for medicines. Administration costs of, of medicines, um, it depends on the country actually we're looking at. In some, it goes up a little, in some, it goes down a little. So it's mixed. Uh, treatment costs for uh, treatment related adverse events goes down across the board. And that's because also the number of adverse events goes down. Other medical resource use, so like um, outpatient visits or any hospitalizations unrelated to adverse events uh, and administration um, go up a little bit, not much. Um, terminal care costs uh, go down. That's because more and more patients survive, so that they, they don't receive terminal care because they survive. Uh, and sick leave payments and disability pension payments go up a little bit. They, they go down initially, but over a five-year horizon, they, they do go up because patients actually survive for longer. But initially, they, they, they go down uh, when patients are actually really receiving um, targeted uh, treatment. They, they go down, but then they go up. Um, and um, so that, that was a bit about the value of um, biomarker testing and precision medicine um, based on this example of non-small cell lung cancer. And I'd like to finish my presentation with uh, talking a little bit about the reality, because what you see now was an ideal situation where every patient would receive biomarker testing and the newest kinds of treatments. But how good have we actually fared uh, in the past in, in Europe? And we also did a study on that. That one is uh, published beginning of, of the year and also um, a scientific publication just now in the Journal of uh, Cancer Policy. Um, and so again, we look at advanced non cell lung cancer. And here I'm showing you results for Poland, uh, which is one of the countries that we had in our study. And uh, there we also followed, uh, there we looked at clinical guidelines to, to derive what we called a, a benchmark and an optimal drug treatment rate for advanced non small cell lung cancer. You see that in the picture to the left. Uh, and you see that um, when in 2014, we only could offer chemotherapy to patients and uh, a little bit of blue that was targeted therapy that's for EGFR and ALK. But then gradually uh, immunotherapy has been introduced. That's the, the yellow part. And also targeted therapy has expanded um, a little bit over, over time. Uh, through new uh, oncogenic drivers where treatments have become available and become recommended also by uh, ESMO, the, the European Society for Medical Oncology. Um, but ESMO also does not recommend actually every, each and every one patient with advanced non-small cells lung cancer to be treated. Uh, patients that have a too poor performance status are not supposed to receive uh, um, treatment with cancer drugs. So the benchmark that you see uh, on the left-hand side ends at around 75%. The remaining 25% would just receive best supportive 
here. Uh, the interesting thing is now to compare, of course, this benchmark with, uh, with what we see in the countries. And in Poland, you see that um, we're actually far off from the 75% benchmark. I mean, in 2014, we're treating around 30% of patients only. That's what we estimate. And it increases until 2020, where we are treating half of patients, 50%, but still uh, way off the 75%. But also the kinds of uh, treatment that patients receive in Poland, hardly any targeted therapy. The blue part is extremely small. So it's like just one or 2% of patients that receive target therapy and also not so many patients that receive immunotherapy. So this switch from <clears throat> this old treatment regimen with chemotherapy to the new kinds of treatment is going extremely slow in, in, in Poland. And Poland is not alone. It uh, looks um, similar in, in many countries in Europe, actually. And um, in the qualitative part of this study, we also asked ourselves why. So why are patients remaining untreated? And we identified four main explanations. You see them to the left. But I'd like to focus on um, the four main explanations that we found for why patients receive older ineffective treatment options. Uh, so with that, I mean chemotherapy instead of the newer kinds of precision medicine uh, therapies. And uh, I think uh, out of the four explanations that you see here, so delays in the reimbursement of modern drugs, that, that's one thing. So the, drug, the EMA approves the drug, but then national countries don't reimburse them. So they cannot be used in clinical practice because the public payer doesn't pay for it. That can be related to limited budget of the, of the public uh, payer, of course. Uh, but, um, but that's just one thing. Uh, the, I'd, I'd like to stress the third explanation here, which is called limited resources for, for testing. Because it's one thing trying to reimburse new medicines, new drugs, that's fantastic. But if you don't also reimburse the testing, um, e either, you know, uh, single plex testing or, or, or N NGS testing, um, with that, then you cannot administer any targeted therapy because you need to do prior testing to, to uh, administer the therapy. And we actually see this sort of weird situation in some countries where newer medicines are reimbursed by the national public payer, but the testing is not reimbursed, which would mean that the patient, him or herself, would need to pay out of pocket. And uh, that means paying anything between 200 euros to 2,000 euros for, for testings. And uh, that's a major, major barrier for, for patients. And clinicians might not even recommend these options to, to their patients because they know it, it's, it's, it's unaffordable for, for patients to pay for, for the testing. So this is, this is a big issue uh, currently in, in Europe, um, and that, that really needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, with that, I'd also like to finish my presentation. So in conclusion, I would say that over the last two decades uh, in oncology broadly, uh, we only have witnessed really the very beginning of precision medicine. In non-small cell lung cancer, we have come the furthest, but uh, other cancer types are really just seeing the beginning and, and more will follow. So we need to be prepared, we need to have a um, uh, good discussion about, uh, about the value of precision medicine. Um, we also see that biomarker testing is becoming increasingly indispensable in, in clinical practice and also the need to shift from single biomarker testing as we've done, let's say in, in lung cancer 10 years ago, to multi-gene testing using, using NGS. I think there's just no way around it. So we need to, to make sure uh, we find a way to implement NGS testing and uh, uh, making sure it really becomes available to, to all patients. Uh, and lastly, um, the, the health economic value. I hope, I hope you, I, I could give you a, a small taste of, of what it means, the health economic value of biomarker testing oncology. It, it deserves really great attention uh, to facilitate the adoption of biomarker testing and multi-gene testing in particular, uh, it's adoption in clinical practice. Um, that's the future. Uh, we need to work on this. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much for this important presentation. I think we are really running out of time, but if you are still there with the privilege of uh, a chairperson, I wanted to ask you because uh, the situation what we are facing is really a bit of controversy. We are discussing really dedicated molecular testing and molecular tumor boards. On the other hand, for instance, in Latvia, we do not have reimbursement for many of the registered medication and even that are included into the guidelines. How modeling could help us in this case? Yeah, yeah so that, that, that's crucial, of course. Uh, I mean, you need to do some, some kind of health economic modeling. And I, I hope that the study that we're, we're conducting now at the, that we will present at, at ISPO Europe uh, can maybe serve as an eye opener because we want to be able to provide some some numbers that can um, help you to have a, a well-grounded discussion on the health outcomes on the one side and the costs uh, on the other side and really making sure we have a broad societal view on on costs because that will help actually to uh, to facilitate the introduction of, of NGS. If you only look at the costs for the tests and the cost of the drugs, we have a very, very slim uh, kind of view, a narrow kind of view that will not be beneficial. We need to also look at the spin-off effects of, of these new technologies because with improving health outcomes, we can save money in, in other areas and that needs to be taken into account. Uh, thank you and sorry we, we really are running out of time so we have to go to the next presentation and uh, sure. thank you so much. much thank you so and let's go back to professor brandel and if if uh, indeed you can squeeze a bit your presentation hopefully the the message and the slides are coming up uh, and and because we are really in 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 uh, should start very soon the next session already sorry for this so thank you very much and uh, i apologize for the internet so due to my t the technical problems that i got help to sort out so once again thank you for um, inviting me and um, i want to show how we have built the precision medicine infrastructure in sweden uh, despite that we do not have national health care we have a regionally organized healthcare system so how did it start? So in Sweden, we have something called Science for Life Laboratory, which is our uh, national infrastructure for high throughput technologies. And we started 10 years ago to discuss how can we move the new technologies into healthcare. And in this process, we started a platform called Clinical Genomics, where academia and healthcare and SciLab could join forces. And in this process, we said, let's form a national initiative, Genomic Medicine Sweden, to, to really uh, perform broad-scale implementation of precision medicine. Just a few words on Scilife Lab. It is 10 um, technology platforms that provide all type of, of omics and other imaging technologies for researchers in Sweden. It is one of these platforms is clinical genomics that I mentioned with seven sites uh, or nodes throughout the country. A very important new uh, um, dimension of Scilifab is the data-driven life science, which is a 12-year program with one of these areas is data-driven precision medicine, which is will become a very important asset for us in Sweden. So together with clinical genomics and genomic medicine in Sweden, we have developed this research implementation cycle to sort of um, transfer technologies and findings from discovery research Clinical Genomics have performed the adaptation and testing and proof of principle uh, demonstrations, whereas uh, genomic medicine then have validated and implemented into healthcare. And we, um, Genomic Medicine Sweden, have seven centers, genomic medicine centers at the university hospitals, and the genomic clinical genomics units are at the, the university or the medical faculty at each university. And in this way, they are uh, twinning um, to make this transition happening throughout Sweden. So this, when we started this, we wanted all actors to be part of it. So in our national steering board, we have representatives from healthcare academia, also patient organizations and industry. And we started the formation in 2017 and it was up and running from 2018. 
And um, this is really a bottom-up initiative. We harmonize um, the, the centers are at the seven university hospitals in Sweden. And we provide, of course, national guidelines, how we should perform the testing and also uh, how they should be delivered to the inpatient care. Um, we really want all citizens to be to have access to these new technologies. And um, despite having this regional distribution, we have a national genomics platform, which is located in west part of the country within healthcare. It's a high perform, uh, compute, performing computing cluster, uh, which is uh, composed of um, three different um, parts, storage, processing and analysis. And um, Right now, we are able to share data uh, within uh, research, research projects um, um, that we are performing within Genomic Medicine Sweden. There are legal some legal challenges with secondary use of health data, uh, and um, this is something that um, um, our government recently launched an inquiry to be able to hopefully change the law to allow secondary use of data. So these are our focus areas and three of them are cancer. And we of course has a number of working groups also helping us in particular informatics, legal is important, but also the other aspects. So just to show that what we have been doing, we have introduced clinical whole genome sequencing already 2015 in rare diseases. And um, last year we in Sweden, we performed 5,000 uh, whole genome sequence analysis in rare diseases with approximately 40% of previously undiagnosed that got the diagnosis. And this is reimbursed by the healthcare system. And right now we are sort of scaling up. Uh, so we also have a digital consent project in order to, to make this more effective. In cancer, we have shown some different strategies. We have one in hematology, we use broad gene panel sequencing. So we do a 200 gene panel for myeloid malignancies. This has been implemented uh, at the five sites that do um, genomic diagnostics and hematology. And last year, we did 3,800 NGS panels in, in routine healthcare which are reimbursed also for, which these are very important for choosing um, direction of, I mean, both for prognostication, but also for deciding um, uh, treatment as have been discussed by previous speakers. Now we are following the same route as for um, rare disease that we are trying to implement whole genome sequencing and transcriptome sequencing. We do this in parallel to diagnostics of acute leukemias during 18 months. And so far we have included 200 out of 350 patients. And um, the data looks very convincing that we will probably be able to replace all the technologies that we're using today, like chromosome analysis, fish, etc. We have uh, just finished validation of a broad comprehensive genomic profiling panel for cancer with 560 genes and that the implementation is ongoing on all sites and the ambition is that this also will be reimbursed and we have had national pilot projects uh, supported by the government for breast ovarian and lung cancer and of course we are the next step will be liquid biopsies. You heard this from um, uh, David Jesus on Nord on pediatric cancer so this is also a very important project that we do together with um, the Bantumar Bank and, and, um, and the Swedish Childhood Society uh, Fund. We also need um, to have access to therapies that was that was discussed, and we we need to really foster new type of studies. One of these uh, drug repurposing studies that are that is carried out in Sweden is Megalit, and um, uh, this was also mentioned uh, by the pre um, from Norway that we have a North Nordic Dutch uh, collaboration on drug repurposing studies, and also Karolinska is part of Cancer Core Europe. And I heard that you have already, someone has mentioned already the molecular tumor board portal that is used within Cancer Core Europe 
uh, as a clinical decision support system. And the first 500 patients were summarized in, in this uh, paper by David Tamberer and Jana Lechtje um, that went through the virtual molecular tumor board and they even sort of, they have um, um, measured the time to decision at the molecular tumor board per patient and they could see how it decreased over time. So I recommend you to really look at that paper. In Sweden, we are now joining forces to to create a national precision cancer medicine trial similar to Norway. We have a testbed Sweden, which we have um, all relevant, uh, all important stakeholders, um, Vision Zero Cancer, Salaf Lab, GMS, Megalith, and also authorities and, pay and, and um, uh, industry, um, branch industry organizations are represented in order to really foster new type of, of, of uh, multi-omics diagnostics, but also even more importantly, clinical trials. We have got funding together with Norway, uh, Nordic countries, uh, Netherlands, and 15 countries to really make sure that we should um, um, distribute the knowledge from, from the Nordic countries and Netherlands for uh, precision diagnostics and also to sort of roll out the DROOP concept. So this, we have a 10 year plan, you can download it, it is in English, um, also how we want to proceed the next 10 years. And um, I, just to sum up, we need to both collaborate on a national, international, but also on a local level. So in Sweden now, precision medicine centers are formed to really um, make sure that it is implemented directly in healthcare. And one of these that was mentioned by the previous speaker that um, diagnostics and the, the treatment is paid uh, differently. This is something also that we are looking into because you really need the diagnostics to select the right patients. And the cost for diagnostics is quite limited compared to the for the treatment. So in my view, this, you have to also work, work locally to make this happen. You need to have international collaboration. Uh, and also I say that genomics, of course, this is the first step. We have to include many different data types and find smart solutions um, uh, to, uh, to make use of all data that we are generating. And we have to do this together. Also, SciLife Lab, which I mentioned in the beginning, and GMS, we have the ambition to, I mean, continue. We have, we have been successful in transferring genomics, but now we have to uh, take all the new technologies and also this with drug profiling, et cetera, to make use of it in, in, um, uh, for future uh, trials, but also for future diagnostics in healthcare. Thank you very much for listening. And again, sorry for my, my uh, intermezzo with the technology. Thank you very much, Professor Bredo, for so comprehensive overview of genomic medicine situation in Sweden. Unfortunately, we have run out of time completely. So.